How are you? I'm very well. How are you? I'm well. Thanks for asking. Congratulations on the number one. Thank you so much. Yes, yeah, very surreal. Surreal, is it? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's amazing, but it's not something we'd ever really thought about. Not even kind of considered. Oh, sure. Sorry, <laughs> that's my that's my reminder to do the interview. Um, um, yeah, it was it was never anything that we'd really considered. Um, so yeah, it was a huge surprise. But yeah, absolutely amazing at the same time. Where were you when you found out? I was actually taking the bins out out. <laughs> The real bins. You're taking. Um, we're taking the garbage out. Go away. Yeah, yeah. It was pretty surreal. I kind of didn't want to just be sitting around waiting because it'd been a kind of nervous week because you get daily updates. But um, so it's just getting on with my normal stuff, and it was yeah, just taking the taking the garbage out as you say when when I found out. <laughs> and what, what what was your reaction? It's just really relieved. It just be. I mean kind of we'd been number one all week so it would have been it would have been a big letdown to suddenly slip up at the last day so I was just really relieved and just really happy and yeah just a lot of emotions it's it's, it's funny when something happens that you've never considered before I don't know if it's ever really happened in my life before because usually you kind of think about even if you're being optimistic about how something might go but that was just completely out of the blue. And yeah, it was really lovely. Like a lot of other musicians that we really look, looked up to kind of were kind of helping us kind of push push it along. So yeah, it was, it was a great week. Really, really nice. Do you remember when Mogwai went from something that was a, a, a bit of a hobby, or, you know, a bit of a getting together with your buddies when you realized like this might be your life? Um... I don't know if there was ever a moment. I mean, probably just a sort of realization, like, oh, we've been doing this a while now. Like, people still like this. Yeah, we can just keep. We can keep doing this. <laughs> so it was probably more of a slow realization rather than any kind of eureka moment. Did you all have jobs when you, when you first started? Martin, our drummer, did. Martin used to manage a Chinese restaurant. Um, He's 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 the oldest, so the rest of us, we were just loving our parents, like using them for food and shelter. <laughs> <laughs> no, we 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 didn't we didn't have jobs. We got like odd jobs to kind of get beer money or whatever. We used to hand out like flyers for other shows, and I think Dominic used to like deliver wine or something. Yeah, we, we've had little jobs, but. I think Martin was the only one who ever had like a proper job. It's a great, a great feeling of gratitude when you actually are able to not have to do the other stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, I think that was one of the benefits of starting so young was that it, it, it wasn't weird that we didn't have money for a while because when you're 19 years old, no one has any money. So it kind of, I think that that was good because it, it let us just, really dedicate ourselves to making music and uh, like a really important time when bands are kind of forming and getting their own identity we could we could put every all our time into it you know and just just concentrate on it completely it's you know it's funny when mogwai kind of first starts exploding and you guys start doing really well it's very different than the other music coming out of the uk that was also popular at that time you know which was a big brit pop era you know your blurs and your oasises and your pulps did you feel like an outsider yeah yeah all the music all the music that we'd grown up really adoring bands like my bloody valentine and sonic youth they kind of gone out of fashion like people just wanted pretty flippant music so we even though there was still people making really stuff that we really liked it was it was very underground so um we definitely felt we were kind of kicking against that kicking against that kind of really flippant style of rock music what do you think has kept you around even not not, not not even just in terms of your fans still loving you but in terms of ye all being able to get along well enough to do it. Because as we both know, bands don't make it this long very often. No, no, as unusual. And I, and I think I, th- I think we enjoy it. 
and we we take the music seriously but we don't take everything super seriously sometimes that can drive people nuts and yeah i think i think we just found good people you know like martin and dominic and barry are really good guys and i hope they would be nice about me too you know and just kind of managed to find a way of working around each other and with each other that's that's been really productive and not not too stressful you know you're not the first one to say that to me hey the sense of humor thing it wasn't an answer i was ever expecting but you're not the first when i've asked what's kept your band together for so long i had one fellow say to me it's only because we can go have a laugh after the show like i don't don't think i don't think it's quite valued enough no i think i think it's i mean it's not just making music i think everything in life you've got you've got to enjoy it you've got to be able to see the funny side and and everything like I mean I guess our music itself is so serious as well that like to try and be that serious um all the time would be exhausting I actually remember one band I won't say the band they were they were a good band actually but they were the opposite of us they were always so miserable and kind of serious and then they go on stage and they'd like jump about like they were having the biggest ever party and it was almost like a mirror image of us and yeah, they broke up. <laughs> <laughs> is that why the album, is that why the song titles are often so funny? Because you said like our music is so serious, you know? Yeah, I, th- I think I think we quite like the juxtaposition. And we also just stopped giving a toss about the song titles a long time ago. Um, it's just, they're usually just silly things people say or, yeah, it's not, it's never... Um, it's never anything heavy. No. Sometimes it, so, sometimes they'll be named after something that's not silly, but it's it, the, the process is is definitely no, not anything like the process of writing the music at all. I've stopped looking for any meaning into the song titles a long time ago. I'll, I'll tell you that much. But I do love hearing you say that, like, I hear, like hearing you acknowledge that the music is very serious because I've always suspected that. Yeah, yeah, we did, and that 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 was one of the things we wanted to do when we started the band. We wanted, we want, we were kind of like not wanting to be like a Britpop band, and everything's like a sort of nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Everything's a big joke. We wanted to make something like we wanted to be like Joy Division. We wanted to be like serious people. <laughs> and I think, to be honest, I think they have a laugh too. I've read like a ton of books about Joy Division, and apart from when when they were making their music, they they were doing dumb stuff like putting a bunch of mice on the buzzcocks tour bus and you know <laughs> taking the mickey out of each other so i think i think it is important i know this might be a bit hard to answer because it's one of those things that's kind of hard to describe but what do you think it is about that kind of music that you liked so much um uh, i just remember i just remember and still do kind of like really appreciate how it, makes you feel you know it kind of it it's probably like the same way like a real art lover would think about some real profound painting or something just like remember hearing like atmosphere by joy division for the first time and it just floored me just thinking that is i mean i've been thinking about it a lot recently and like almost not being able to compute i mean i was a teenager when i when i would have heard it but not being able to compute how people could make this you know, and this obviously as the years go on, you kind of learn how to make music and learn how other people made music, but that there's something kind of magical about music and yeah, I, I just kind of wanted to be part of that in some way. It's, it's beautiful, you know, it, it made me think, and there's a world in which I say this and it sounds very snobby and that's not definitely not how I mean it, but you know, I can get a little shot of delight looking at a tweet or something like that, but I can get like a, a depth of emotion like an undeniable, unbelievable depth of emotion, like reading a book or something like that. Yeah. You know, it feels yeah. like that, that feels like what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It, to- it totally is. And I, I mean, kind of jumping from subject to subject, there was someone talking about how like streaming services pay bands and someone made the comparison that, yeah, you might not, you might, might not watch a Tarkovsky film every week but that doesn't mean that it's not had a massive effect on you 
and they were kind of pointing that out as the kind of the the imbalance between how they pay artists on streaming services, like something that's on like a in a someone's cafe playlist every day, will be making tons more money than maybe some piece of piece of music that's changed people's lives, but that they maybe don't listen to every day. I've you know, never, it's, I've never thought about it, it like that before. That yeah. like, yeah, I could listen to, and I like Taylor Swift, and I could probably listen to a Taylor Swift song every day. I think if I listen to like a, a Mogwai song or like a Godspeed You Black Emperor song every day, I don't know what had happened to me. You know what I mean? Like, mind <laughs> you, I'm saying this to a guy who listens to a Mogwai song every day, but you know what I mean? I, I know exactly what you mean. And and and, and to, be all, to be honest, I think it's like, I think it's an important conversation because um, if people stop buying records, which I don't think is happening right now, but see if the worst happens and people do stop buying records, bands like us and Godspeed will struggle to be able to keep making new records, you know, because it's not the kind of thing that people listen to every single day. But yeah, yeah. Well, we'll be fine. I'm not. I'm not going on a yeah. woe is me. But you called yourself a, the, the what the PS five of music. I saw that. Oh yeah, it was because because all, all our vinyls sold out everywhere, <laughs> which is pretty amazing too. But um, yeah, I, I, it's definitely a conversation people should be having because I, I think people fixate with streaming about the amount of money per stream and not actually looking at the big picture of well, what are we actually paying for here. And it's, it's someone maybe used to listen to something 10 times and it's changed their life and, and streaming doesn't reward those kind of artists, you know? Yeah. Frequency is not always appreciation. I never thought about that before. No. Uh, It's funny that your records are selling out everywhere and you can't keep any of them. It was also funny to listen to this record by myself in, in headphones it feels a bit weird because one, I think you're a great live band, but also it felt a bit um, appropriately catastrophic to be in my living room during this pandemic listening to this music. What are you hearing from people who are listening to this record at home? I, th- I think it's made a connection on that front. I think that's one of the reasons that people have really taken to this record. I think that music that's really personal which I think our music is, has helped people get through this really harsh year. And um, yeah, it's, I, I think it's going to be amazing when we get to go out and play it, but I think that people are connecting really strongly with it in their unusual lives that we're, 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 we're leading right now. I think for the most part, we've been talking about your instrumental music and um there's a song on this record that stuck out to me. It's not the you know, first time I've heard lyrics and I've heard you sing on the record, but um, just take a listen to this. Her eyes crystal If you're just tuning in, I'm Tom Power. This is Q. The song you're hearing right now is called Richie Sacramento from Mogwai's new album, As the Love Continues. I'm speaking with the singer of that song and member of Mogwai, Stuart Braithwaite. Um, so in addition to being a rare song of yours with lyrics, I also know it's, it's a personal one to you. Could you tell me a little bit about that song? Yeah, it's it's it was kind of started off. I started writing the lyrics after I, I read a story about Dave Berman that Bob Nastanovich from Pavement posted online. Bob's a friend of ours. We played with Pavement a lot, and kept in touch. And I knew, I knew Dave Berman a bit, not super well, but I was a big fan of his. And, you know, it just kind of, it was a story about him throwing a shovel at a sports car when they were students. And that was what he said, Rise Crystal Spear, which is the, the first line in the song. And yeah, I just wanted to write a little bit about Bob and also about, some other people I know that the that aren't still with us, and yeah, it's it's quite personal. Um, it's also quite a a weighty task because I think Dave Berman was um, one of the best songwriters of my lifetime. You know, a really incredible talent, but also a really sweet guy, and yeah, it, it, it felt a good a good thing to kind of commemorate him in a song. 
Dave Berman of Silver Jews, what did you like about him and his music? I like I like the hum- I like the the humor, the way he could be funny and poignant at the same time, um, very witty. Um, some of the music's really traditional, but seems uh, like almost surpasses the traditions that he's he's um, utilizing. So yeah, just a a wonderful wonderful musician. If anyone's listening hasn't heard any Silver Jews records, they should go and check them out straight away. Or Dave's uh, last band, Purple Mountains, which was amazing. We we, we were obsessed with that record. Um, and so excited about seeing him play the songs, which sadly didn't no one got to see. But yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing record. It's really, really great. I was wondering if you could talk to me about something I read you talking about that I had never thought of before. And of course, you know, here in Canada, we were sort of spectators to, to Brexit. And we had seen some stuff about how it would impact, you know, um, imports to Canada or currently, you know, vaccines to Canada and stuff like that. But I heard you talk about how it affects musicians who perform in the UK and perform in in Europe. I wonder if you could talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, there is, there's, there's a, I mean, if you're in Canada, can you imagine that you used to be able to just go and play in America and not, you didn't even have to do anything, just show them your passport or whatever, and that's fine. And then one day it becomes like it is now, which is basically what's happened. And um, the, the, the most galling part of it is that the EU were apparently happy to have a sort of reciprocal swap to just let UK artists go and play in the EU for a month or two, and the same with EU artists. And the, the UK government said no, because they just didn't want to be seen to be doing anything to help European people. So, but, so hold on. So, so you were able to play between the UK and in in Europe. I mean, given that there was you were part of the European Union, you were able to play uh, uh, visa free. If you were in yeah. France, you could drop over to to um, Britain, and then you could drop over to the Republic of Ireland, and then you could play all without having to worry about it. But now, you need a, a visa for each individual country. Yeah, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And the other thing about it as well is that the, the music industry is worth something insane, like six billion pounds a year. And the fishing industry is worth like 5% of that. And they've done so much to help the fishermen, which is fair enough. I mean, people need to fish, I suppose, but they've just kind of completely abandoned this entire industry that makes the UK a fortune. Like, you know, you're thinking about the amount of money these I'm not talking about Mogwai, I'm talking about whoever, like Lewis Capaldi or Adele or these kind of people, you know, they're 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 really messing up like a huge industry. Yeah. It's, it, it, and it's not people at the big level that it's gonna affect. It's people starting out. That's that's who's gonna be really adversely affected by it. And and the and the other thing that just makes me really furious is that Scotland voted against this. Yeah. And one of the reasons that Scotland was told to not vote for independence was that voting for independence would mean leaving the EU. So Scotland voted to stay in the UK so that we could remain in the EU. And then they left the EU anyway and Scotland could do nothing about it. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to... I'm going to have to go for a lie down after this. I, I, <laughs> I'm severely triggered. <laughs> I'll, send you, I'll send you a bill afterwards. Don't worry about it. Okay. Well, I, well, then I can assume how things might go then next um, Scottish independence election. If, well, the, the UK government don't seem to want to allow one. So who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? Last thing on this. Does this shag things up for Mogwai, though? Like at your level, does this change anything with your tour? Not really. Not really. It's more hassle. We, I mean, we're, we're, we're at a level where it's just it's a bit more paperwork and yeah, it'll, it'll cost us some money, but it's not going to really affect us. It's more it's more people just trying to do their first tours, and whereas a, a, a thousand pounds or a few thousand pounds is really going to mean that they can't do it. So it's 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 going to kind of pull away the bottom rungs of the ladder for a lot of people, 
but yeah, no, we'll 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 be okay. But I think in the in the long run, it's going to be bad for culture on here and in the EU as well. How are you finding being off the road? Um, I'm missing it. Yeah, I'm missing it. I'm probably missing watching music as much as I'm missing playing music. But I think it's going to come back. We've got we've got some shows booked. Do you? For for later in the year, yeah. So I think it's going to be back sooner. We're doing actually not too bad with the the vaccines here. Touch wood, but um, yeah, I, I think it'll be back sooner rather than later, and hopefully, be back to playing everywhere next year. I saw you guys in Dublin one time, and you know I had that very classic Mogwai experience where about ten fifteen minutes into the show, I sort of closed my eyes and let it kind of wash over me. What's that like for you? A, is it, I'm sure it's very touching, but is there also kind of moments where you're looking at the crowd going like, does anyone have their goddamn eyes open? Like, is... <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just really nice. You know, it's just really a nice experience knowing when it's going well, that like people are, people are really, really getting something from the music. I actually was thinking of it this recently when, it, and going back to when I mentioned Pavement, I remember when we opened for them and like, watching them from the back inside the stage or the back or whatever, and just looking at how much people really loved it. And I remember thinking, man, it would be amazing if we could do that. <laughs> and I think maybe we're getting to the point where we can. Yeah. But I remember thinking, just watching how much people really were so happy to hear that music. And yeah, that was, that was a really big inspiration for me. Not even just happy, but sort of visceral. You know what I mean? Like sort of you watch people go through something with the music. It's lovely. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. It's been a while, so it kind of feels like I'm talking about someone else's band. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I I hope it's still like that when we get back to doing it. 25 years, um, Stuart. Where where do you hope things go from here? Um, Just like it to, to, to keep going, just keep making music, keep playing shows, keep going fun places and yeah, I'm, 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 I'm just happy with things rolling along. No, I've never been insanely ambitious, and but always happy to do any opportunities that come up. And it's, it's always worked out pretty well. So yeah, just happy for that to kind of keep going. Never been overly ambitious, really. I mean, it is an unlikely, it can feel like sometimes an unlikely style of music to get as successful as it has i would assume some amb- ambition in there if you don't mind me saying um well we had a handful of ambitions we, we, did, we wanted to get played on the john peel show and we wanted to play this place in glasgow called the barrowlands but that was the only things we really wanted to do all our other ambitions were to do with to do with doing something really good we wanted to like make a great record or play a really great show it wasn't like we want to play a whatever tens of thousands of people or anything we, we, we kind of came from the DIY scene so that whole world never even seemed possible you know we were kind of even when we felt like we were doing the odd big shows opening for other bands it was kind of like we felt we kind of fluked our way on there so <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know if we ever really were ambitious but then I guess there's a difference between not being ambitious and not limiting yourself. You know, uh, we've definitely always, if something's come up, we went, yeah, we'll go for it, you know, but I don't know. I think, I, I think setting unlikely goals can just make, can make um, achievements seem like disappointments. Say that again. Well, like if you, if you, if you kind of have goals that are super ambitious and you don't quite get it, and you just feel a bit disappointed, even though you've probably done pretty great. Oh, it's beautiful. I'm hiring you on, man. I'm gonna really. Yeah, I'm gonna. Hi- yeah, I am. I'm gonna. I'm gonna get you to record a meditation app for me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's been lovely to talk to you. Can you? We're gonna go out on on dry fantasy. What can you tell me about dry fantasy? Yeah, this was one of the first songs we started working on. This is one Barry wrote on on his synth, and yeah, it's it, it turned out really, really nice. I'm really, really fond of it. Um, I don't know if there's a lot else to say about it. The title's another silly thing. He was trying to tell me not to use too much reverb on my guitar, and I said that I didn't want anything to do with his dry fantasy. 
So yeah, it's, it's typical nonsense, but yeah, it's it's it's, it's a nice it's a, it's a nice piece of music. I'm really happy with it. Nice to talk to you, and and thank you for the record, and and uh, I mean it. It's been lovely music over these years. Thank you for it. Cheers, man. Thank you so much.